Chronicles of Chartrullian. Episode 10, The Broken Prince. So nice to have my children join me for dinner for a change. It wasn't like pulling teeth at all. And Sithalia, and Laum, you're welcome to come sit down with us. You don't have to stand guard all night. Good luck trying to get him to do anything normal. I heard he took a fall. By the time Tomlin got to him, he was back to his usual lumpy self. Couldn't find anything wrong. Hmm. Where's Yoba this evening? Taking dinner in his apartment, I believe. Still feeling unwell, he said. Did you make it to Astraeus today? I did. Um, to care to discuss? Well, I was going to talk to you about this once there was more of a plan. But they asked me to help with the new Jardakai recruits. Ah. As much as I like your spunk, we need to talk these things through before you go breaking those kind of doors down. As if you'd even care to hear about what I want to do. Does this have anything to do with you giving Chartrullian your mother's brooch? It's not what you think. He's just helping me learn more about it. I've even asked for it back already. So. Oh, good. I'll talk to Lapidine. The kind of help they need is all about connections. It'll be hard, given the climate, but uh, I think you're ready. <sighs> Imsip, are you not hungry? I would rather have dinner with my friends. I'm tired of this bland food. You can thank your sister for that. Why? <laughs> no, I've requested a commoner's diet after the garish display that was the banquet. Rations and all. You can return to the countryside if you'd like. I don't want to go back there either. It's so isolated. <sighs> Whatever. Oh, Suit yourself. Don't be ridiculous. Oh, no. You seem to be getting on here just fine, Fressy. Of course, you have a strapping older man to flirt with, so I suppose <laughs> that's to be expected. That's not true, and he's not that much older than me. He must be twice as old as you. Have you seen him? That's not true. <laughs> Besides, I don't Flirt. I have to agree with your sister on this one. If she did, she'd be married by now. Oh, can we find <laughs> something else to talk about? Anything. <laughs> Sothalia, aren't you hungry? It's a, a, a little... See, it is the food. Loam isn't eating either. Isn't that right, Guardian? I don't think this is his diet. His diet? Why is Frussy's Guardian a normal girl? And mine is a big dumb rock? You always ask not to be bothered. Loam doesn't speak, so I thought it was the perfect fit. He's... Barely human. I mean, look at him. He looks like a shaved wild animal. Maybe you should try treating him like a human. I'm sure he's completely fascinating if you just try for once. I'm not interested. Have you smelled him? Uh, I'd like to talk about Imsip and his friend Josquin. How long do you plan on keeping him locked up, pray tell? Until I can discuss it with my cabinet. As you can imagine, we've been busy with more important things. <laughs> Do they even know what's going on? What Yoba's accusing him of? They'll be informed. But that matter has no place at the negotiation table. In the meantime, don't you go doing anything stupid. Oh, don't you worry about it. It's me. What could I do? Ha! <laughs> Yoba seems to have some wild ideas. If Lom could speak, I'd ask him where you've been sneaking off to at night. He's dumb, but he'd never betray me. Even if I was up to something nefarious. Isn't that right, Lom? Josquin may be your friend, but his antics cannot be tolerated. Do you understand me? I want to hear you say that you understand. Oh, no, loud and clear, Father. I understand loud and clear. As the evening hours wore on, Arcus's sister moons sank below the horizon leaving Simitu in uncomfortable darkness. The silhouette of a boy carried a thin silver blade through Astraeus' gardens, stopping at a bed of violets. The boy pinched it at the stem and recoiled when he felt sharp pain. He pulled a small thorn from his thumb and a droplet of blood formed where it had been. The droplet rolled over the side of his hand and fell to the slab of stone between his feet. It writhed as it hit the stone, turning from red to black and arcing into a tortured shape as if reacting to the vibration of some mysterious force. 
The boy didn't seem to take notice of this and continued cutting the flower with the blade. At the other end of the complex, wind carried salt into the gymnasium through a gaping hole in the wall left by the day's sparring accident. It swirled and coalesced in piles along the wall and in every corner as if it were long abandoned. The dull thudding of footsteps broke the eerie silence. The desert wolf ambled in, its giant, salt-caked paws straining with each heavy footfall. The beast's head glided close to the ground as it followed the scent of its prey. In the foyer, Chartrullian jolted awake from his prolonged nap. He was surprised to find himself alone and sitting in complete darkness. Curious. Borsha always left a light on somewhere, but not this night. He pushed himself upright and stretched his aching back. His fingers moved to his temples, where the sensation of Safrosini's soothing touch lingered. He thought he could still pick up traces of her scent, but then it was overcome by a heavy musk, mixed with the briny scent of salt and sweet metallic scent of blood. It was out of place, and invoked such fear in him that he was unable to move. He felt eyes on him from somewhere far off in the darkness and reluctantly followed the sensation. That's when he saw the monstrous silhouette of the wolf lurking at the end of the hall, glowering at him with not two, but four ghoulish red eyes. Saliva dripped from its snout, making pools on the floor. Strings of it clung to long, wiry hair. Black void mists emanated from the back of the monster wolf, creeping toward Chartrullian along the walls like blind, probing tentacles. This is a dream. You're not really here. Dream. Is it something more? What are you? You know what I am. You're just afraid to say my name. Shardakai, what happened to the moss boar? I lost my patience. They were destroyed. That's not how you operate. Did you let your herd, the ones you'd sworn to protect, destroy you? No. I think you and I both know that the need to survive, survive. choice, duty. Why are you here? To finish what the Berserker could not. A river of blood, carrying violence, hundreds of them. Shame. Litrin, Tamina, I won't let you hurt them. You are powerless to stop me. Etruvian. I will find a way. You could rejoin with me. Rejoin? How? By letting me devour you. I'll give you a head start. If you value your life, you will run. No. The door has been shut behind me. No! Wait! She wants me to return the brooch. Where did you get this? It's been a part of my family for a long time, and i just like to know why. In giving it to me, she expected something I failed to deliver. I had this expectation that something big would happen. She never said anything about it until just now. It'd be best to just take it back. Is there still enough time to correct it and save myself from one more disappointment? Someone's left a note. 
The princess wanted me to tell you that she will return tomorrow to discuss Idrica plans with Havalian and Admiral Lapidine. The gym fire was minor, no damage to report. Also, Havalian took care of the bug in your room, but apologizes for the burning smell. I'm afraid to ask. Happy to see you getting some rest. P.S. I left you a tonic for the headache in case it persists. <sighs> Is she all right? Did anything happen? Shh. Calm down. No need to panic. Just a bad dream. Oh. Pavelian is in there with her now. Let's not disturb them more than we have to. How many nights does he spend here? Most. All apart. Have there been any changes in Ditron? Not that I've observed. Why? Just a feeling. Maybe it's time. Time for what? To let others weigh in. You're going to Idrica. Take them with you. Ugh. They need more than I can give. Who can help them there? Yulia? The mystics? So they can say what? You could seek out Artemis. <laughs> Assuming he's still alive. He is. And he's returned to Idrica. I would rather not involve him if I can avoid it. I sure hope Villian's having fun digging around in the ice. <sighs> Something else is bothering you. What is it? If Havalian asks, let him know I've stepped out. Stepped out? Where are you going? I need some air. Well, wherever you're off to, may Jardeo guide and protect you. Where I'm going, I will need it. Chartrullian held his breath as his foot crossed the threshold of the side gate of the Agora. The hood of a dark gray shawl was pulled low over his face. Watchmen patrolled the area, floating red diamonds in the shadows and the subtle sound of mechanisms giving away their positions. The Jardejo temple towered over him like a sleeping giant. Whatever temporary insanity had brought him there was beginning to wear off. The Agora itself was a labyrinth of lush gardens, where figures in long robes promenaded along rare and exotic plants and insects. The Azuria gifted it with magical properties that could not be fully understood. It all seemed too easy. He'd expected an invisible force field to knock him back for an alarm to sound, but none of that happened. Three large domed prayer chambers stood at the heart of the labyrinth, one dedicated to each of the star makers, Jardika, Jardikai, and Jardestra. Jardika's prayer chamber was the tallest of the three and occupied the center. As Chartrullian neared it, he stepped around and over a handful of monks lost in their meditation. Some of them had most likely been like that for days. Inside the chamber was a deep pool of turquoise water. The top of the dome was completely open to the night sky. A stone bridge cut through the middle, and an effigy of Jardika, half the height of the chamber, reached for the heavens above, open tome in hand. As Chartrullian's eyes met Jardika's cold, lifeless ones, the memories overcame him. The first took him all the way back to when he was just a baby. He had lived out the first years of his life suspended in a similar turquoise fluid, deep in the vaults of Bethema. I was a motherless child in a strange world. And then the Jardejo Order took me in and called me their Messiah. I was destined to change the world. Nestled in the base of the effigy was a low, flat bowl filled with large crystals of azurium salts. Chartrullian dipped his hand into the bowl and let the grains fall between his fingers. He loved the sensation. It reminded him of when he was a young boy, exploring the temple grounds, absorbing the planet's rich history, and reveling in the Agra's beauty. Right here, 
Where I stand is where Jardica was invoked within me. I was just a boy, and in retrospect, it was cruel. There were so many things that I looked forward to enjoying about the world. I never stopped trying to find beauty where I could, but it was difficult to see past the pain. The only solution was to become something that was no longer human. But to no longer feel pain was to also no longer be able to truly appreciate beauty. He was ten years old again when he pulled his hand from the bowl. The void came crashing into consciousness, and suddenly the effigy was animated. Those cold, lifeless eyes were suddenly one giant eye on a featureless face. That one eye had something greater than life in it. Something incomprehensible. Something terrifying. Jardica helped me reach into the void and showed me the many different paths I could take. But I wasn't satisfied. So instead, I looked to the past. It was there that I found Jardikai. Despite the advice of my mentors, I chose to become something different than what was expected of me. I chose to become an abomination. Chartrullian released the memory of his first encounter with Jardika and continued past the effigy towards the back of the chamber. It opened up into a long, narrow stone gallery. Moss dangled from the ceiling like jewelry, and stone pedestals displayed various ancient artifacts. Lining the walls were statues of all the Etruvians throughout recorded history. He paused at the foot of the statue of a woman with sharp, unpretty features, and his eyes filled with knowing. It was Jardikai who showed me the lost ancestral knowledge. How the Etruvian Rankusha harnessed the power of the Source, and developed incredible technologies. But back then, the world wasn't ready to go down that path and civilization was nearly destroyed for it. All of her work is now lost to history, destroyed by fire and then buried in ice, or perhaps hidden away intentionally. I thought history wouldn't repeat itself under my watch, but I have brought the hour of the wolf upon us once again. Finally, Chartrullian reached a statue of himself. The word abomination was written across the forehead and had only been partially erased. Either whoever was cleaning it last agreed with the message or just gave up. This man is not me. He looks so confident. I would trust this man. My visions of the future were far too broad to see any of this coming. Never once did I think to look at my own life. Now I wish I had. I was naive. And the Berserker is the price I have to pay. But if this is the way it has to be, do I wholly despise being just a man? There are people here who wouldn't be happy to see you, Chartrullian, so on their behalf, let me welcome you. I am surprised that this thing is still standing. Well, he doesn't come this way much anymore because of it, so you should be relatively safe here. It is a relief to see you, Magagoso. How did you recognize me? Ah, your walk. You do this thing where you... Put one foot perfectly in front of the other. Ah, it drives me crazy. How should I walk? Oh, I don't know. 
Maybe with a little less, uh, purpose. Speaking of which, I hope you had a good reason to risk coming here. I... I need your help with something. Okay, I'm listening. I need you to get me into the archives. The archives? I thought you had all that stuff stored up there in that, uh, impressive noggin of yours. I am still having some difficulty. Oh, not bad, huh? You know, I've never heard of an Etruvian losing their abilities. Well, maybe I'm the exception. Hmm, yeah, maybe. I guess if you piss off a god badly enough. About that. Tonight I had my first nightmare in a long time. Something about it didn't feel right. Oh, what was it about? I was being chased by a monstrous wolf that spoke to me as Jardikai. Oh, how did you escape? I don't think I did. I can get you into the archives, but the kind of stuff you probably want has been locked away. And, uh, I don't have the key. They, uh, <laughs> don't trust me anymore. What are you needing exactly? I've come into possession of something odd. Can you take a look? All right, follow me. But do me a favor. Walk, uh... Stupid, okay? Here we go. I can only get you this far. This old kiosk is useful for analyzing trinkets, but oh well. And thankfully, this room is relatively private. Yes, I remember it well. Ah, I hate using computers. Well, the speed is nice. I prefer my books. <laughs> Ah, uh, a slow life is a good life. Yeah, well, unfortunately, there is no time. Computers were meant to aid human progress, not replace it completely. Uh, the Order's admonishment of technology is a mistake. Don't get all pithy on me, okay? Just put whatever that thing is that you got on the pedestal. I need to get a good rendering of it. Here we go. This thing is miserably slow. Oy. So a slow life is only good when computers work as expected. Ah, shut up. Computers. Ah. A world that makes its own gods wouldn't need the star makers anymore, you know. Then there'd be no reason for any of us to exist. And we'd all be back <sighs> to square one. Margo, hmm. we've had this debate. Hundreds of times. So... Aren't I playing God by your definition? It's a cycle, son. Uh, a new technology gets introduced and everyone panics. But over time, it loses its shock value and we eventually find some usefulness in it. Every piece of technology we see today was, at one time, considered uh, abominable. Even, Even the, the tools, tools that, that carve, carve the stone, stone that makes up, makes this, up this, this very temple. Stop that. You still enjoy hearing the sound of your own voice, don't you? Yeah. Does this uh, thing work any faster? It's nice actually having someone to say these things to. To talk out loud again. I'm afraid if I go too long without saying the things that need to be said, I'll forget why I'm here. Turn into one of those Jardikas sitting around the Agora out there. Well, he checked out and pretty much waiting to die. They don't have to face reality as long as their eyes stay shut. Where did you get this jewel, by the way? <clears throat> okay, okay, fine. Keep your secrets. Results. Oh, okay. Ah, interesting. There are some Starbringer women mixed in here. Stop. That must be her. Hona? Ah, uh, such a tragedy. What can you tell me? She was a descendant of an ancient Jardesra bloodline. In fact, they thought for a while she would make an Etruvian. Then her health turned. Health turned? Yeah, yeah. Nobody was ready for it, and nobody understands it. One day, she was just dying. After her death, Maldoro had the audacity to have the body taken to the Thema Labs. Oh, man. King Starbringer was beside himself. He was so furious. 
It's a shame Ahona's children didn't inherit her more wild characteristics, especially the prince. What a dud. This image is older. Who is this? A relative, most likely. Looks like the jewel changed hands more than a few times. She said it's an heirloom. She? Ah, uh, I think I see what's going on here. If the princess is even half the woman her mother was, <laughs> you're in for a wild ride, my friend. How do you mean? Not all of Jardejo's woohoo magic is woohoo. The Jardestra have strange ways about them. <laughs> There's nothing about the inscription here. You shouldn't need a computer for that. I can read 17 dead languages. If it was that easy, I wouldn't be here. Well, then let's put it to the test. What's this? Just pick a page and read me a passage. <sighs> um, at noon on the eleventh day, taketh the beast and beateth until dead with a flat stone doused in sacred oil. <laughs> what is this nonsense? Uh, a cookbook. <laughs> and where are you going to find a beast to beateth? While well, one can dream. This is about the quality of literature you can find around here these days. How bad is it? Huh. The level of censorship yeah, is unprecedented. Not much work for a archivist to do these days. If no one can get to the books. I suppose it's a good thing you have hobbies then. Shh. The last thing I need is anyone around here finding out about my my so-called hobbies. So shh. Ah. Looks like that's the end of the results, but take it with a grain of salt. Like the stacks, these archives have been heavily edited. Ah, don't look so disappointed, son. This is just very frustrating. <laughs> well, if old age has done anything for me, it's taught me that some of the greatest truths are the most difficult to find. And the answers are usually never where you expect. Sometimes I miss temple life. Astraeus comes with far too many distractions. You do enjoy your work though, right? Son, I'm going to say something that you probably kicked me for, but I'm going to say it anyway. I believe your compassion is what makes you the best Etruvian we've seen in several millennia. Look at me. I don't see an abomination, son. I see a treasure. I doubt history will be that kind to me. That depends. The Order may have tried to destroy you, but... That doesn't change what you are. Let's get out of here before either of us get caught, okay? From a high balcony, Maldoro watched Magagoso emerge from the galleries with a stranger. The stranger exhibited excellent posture, moving one foot in front of the other. Not many walked with such a deliberate gait. In fact, he only knew one. A wave of heat exploded from his core at the recognition. Usha Trulian is playing with fire by coming here, and Mogogoso is doing little to douse it. Perhaps it's time to bring his crimes against the Order into the spotlight, before he gives my enemies any advantage. Like clockwork. Saida has not checked in. The transition may not have been successful. Yeah, I have every confidence that it was. <laughs> Most likely there's nothing to report. He knows not to take any unnecessary risks coming to us for idle chatter. This better not be a disappointment. No oh, disappointment. Patience. We'll find out soon enough where the prince runs off to in the dead of night. Mm. 
Loam followed Imset through a sea of young, sweaty bodies, writhing and flexing in unison under the dim lights of the speakeasy. His unblinking eyes glistened eerily in the intense blue light. Only one man in the crowd seemed to notice the out-of-place giant as they passed. Everyone else had completely tuned out the world around them. Imsep pushed his way through a narrow corridor into a private room, where a young man practiced mixology with an assortment of brightly colored liquors. A small group of people had gathered to witness his art and drink the glowing concoctions. One of them was Abraset. Back so soon. I can't stand being in the capital right now. You're making this a dangerous place for us to be, you know. What do you mean? You're being shadowed. Didn't you notice? Yoba. He must have... <laughs> and that's no good, is it? What do I do? <sighs> Subtlety has never really been your thing, has it? I can't help it. Loudness is a family trait. When we're done here, just keep him off my back. This is the last time you'll find me here. Lone will take care of it. Did you get what you asked for? We did. Thank you for your contribution. I would say go take a look for yourself, but I'd rather not alert the Capitol Guard to our little operation out back. Fine by me. I'd rather not lose my appetite. Your heart may be in the right place, but your stomach is still weak. I upset easily. Another family trait, it seems. So, what brings you here? Something's just come up you might find interesting. Concerning? The shipbuilder and my sister. It seems all too convenient that my father would start pushing the idea of marriage just as he commissions him to build a ship for her. The king is ordering expensive toys for his daughter while people struggle to survive. Did the shipbuilder agree to this madness? I don't actually know, but she's been spending an awful lot of time at Astraeus lately. I wouldn't be surprised if there was more than meets the eye. The Etruvian doesn't marry. This one does a lot of things the other Etruvians didn't do, doesn't he? Anyway, use the information as you see fit. We agreed not to slander Shortrulian, but maybe we don't have to. Public opinion of him is favorable, as it is for your sister. Just because she's a girl. It's not fair. You've been more useful to us in a short time than the city's most notorious mover of information. We should paint you as a hero. Uh, it's not for me. Has anything else changed? Father has no intention of releasing Josquin. Why would he? Besides, Josquin is exactly where he wants to be. You keep saying that, but I still don't get it. The people are sympathetic to Josquin. When it gets out that your father is trying to censure him, it won't sit well now, will it? But we have to time everything just right. So now what? We're working on a plan to ally with the Order. What? Enough has happened recently that I think they'll actually go for it. H how do we do that? I can't do anything. So far, I've been able to maintain relative anonymity, and it should stay that way a little longer. You, however, you can do more. If you're serious about taking down your own family, that is. I am serious. Good. What would you need me to do? Talk to Maldoro. Convince him to join us. I don't know how that would go over. You have information, insider access to everything that happens in the capital, and Astraeus. It's gold. There's no way he'd be able to turn you away. I guess. What should I say then? Tell him everything you told me last night about Astraeus. Anything having to do with Chartrulian makes him see red. I, the more severely he reacts, the better our odds of striking a deal. The Starbringer family makes him see red. What makes you think I can just walk in there without causing a scene? If that's what it takes. I, I guess I can't waste time pondering the dangers. Glad you see it my way. Although... Sorry. The gears are turning on what you just told me. Maybe Josquin isn't the champion we need. You'd abandon him? No! He may be all for show, but not expendable. Not just yet, anyway. Well then, it's time for me to make an exit. Now, about that shadow of yours... I'll have Lone give him a good scare. Scare? Is this still some passing fancy for you, just to get back at Daddy? 
Or are you ready to get your hands dirty with us? Hands dirty, but I hope that's hypothetical. Then don't take a risk. It has to be spotless. Fine, then. We'll make it spotless. You really are a treasure. It's a shame your father can't see you the way we do. Loam, find the man who watched us enter and make him disappear. Mm. For someone of Loam's height, scanning the dance floor of the speakeasy was fast work. He spotted the man who watched them enter within seconds and made eye contact. The man's surprise at the recognition was palpable. He quickly pushed his way deeper into the crowd, moving at a casual pace at first, then picking up speed as Loam began to trail him. Loam's strange, unblinking eyes looked hungry, as if some repressed hunter instinct had kicked in. Or perhaps he was acting outside his own volition. On the other side of the building, Abraset slipped through the back door of the speakeasy, hood pulled low over his face. A long queue of people waited there, but weren't trying to enter. They were civilians, elderly, women and children. Men in black cloaks were handing them parcels of food and medicine out of the back of a transport. Now go with speed. Watchmen are on prowl tonight. We've been compromised. How do you know? The prince returned with company. Oh, poor thing wants to help. He's doing the best he can. Don't linger, and be careful not to leave a trace. After tonight, we're on the move again. to your new host. <laughs> How annoying. Is he missing a tongue? What's going on? Here at night at this rate. The young prince goes to the temple on the morrow to plead with one Maldoral, head of the order, he is working with the new regime to dethrone his own father. <clears throat> What's more is that the princess and her guardian have intimate access to Astraeus. Mm, interesting. What have you learned about Astraeus? Mm. Astraeus is more vulnerable than it appears. I have yet to learn more. Mm. I see. This could be a lot easier than we thought. <laughs> we should leave the princess and her guardian uncorrupted. I can see her being used differently. There must be another way in. For now, we focus our attention on this Maldoro character. Would you be so kind as to deliver a message to him on our behalf? <laughs> I hope to reinforce the critical nature of our request. Your old host is fading quickly. And I think meeting you 
current form could be just the motivation they need to come to a decision. <laughs> the Madness of Chartrullian was created by H.M. Radcliffe. Original music by Sean Renner, performed by Sean Renner and the Invoke String Quartet, with additional music by Ethan Billups. Editing and sound design by H.M. Radcliffe and Edward Calvi, with additional sound design by Will Fox. Narrated by Michael De La Mancha. Starring Aud Andrews, Brian Bachman, Chris Bellinger, Magnus Carlson, Adrian Galley, Angela LaRocca Hawkman, Kathleen Klein, Steve Lefever, Stacy Lightman, Heath Martin, Hunyaha Mukherjee, Nina Nikolic, Carl Nordman, Kennedy Phillips, Danielle Yonkers, and Willie Zepp. This has been a Pacquiao Media original production. Visit chartrulian.com to learn more.